a production of Kentucky State University Aquaculture. Aquaculture is the world's fastest growing food producing sector. Nearly half of the fish consumed in the world are now grown rather than captured from the wild. China is number one in aquaculture production, representing nearly 70% of the global market, with other Asian countries together totaling about 90% of world production. The United States ranks 11th in global seafood production. Channel catfish is still the number one food fish produced in the United States. But strong competition from Asian countries that are able to export catfish and other food fish products into the United States is causing a loss of market share for U.S. growers. There are several issues American farmers must address. Lack of investment capital for producers. A shortage of land and water suitable for aquaculture. The cost of feed, which is 50% of most aquaculture operations and the environmental impact from effluent. So you may ask, with these limitations, how can domestic producers compete in the global marketplace? Farmers must use innovative practices that fit within the framework of sustainable aquaculture. Sustainable aquaculture maximizes resources, energy, and production, while minimizing negative environmental impacts. At the same time, the quality of life for workers and consumers should be improved. Alabama fish farmers are testing some sustainable systems. One system is the floating raceway that can be moved from pond to pond. Two different fish species can be grown in the same pond. Here, catfish are raised in the open pond and hybrid striped bass in the raceway. Water flows continuously through the raceway using an airlift system. Split pond is another system that has shown three to five times higher catfish production than that in traditional catfish ponds. About 20% of the pond is used for intensive catfish production. Fish are heavily stocked in earthen raceways that separate the two pond sections. There is a raceway on each end of the pond. Water flows continuously through the two raceways into both sides of the split pond. Several species, such as paddlefish, minnows, tilapia, and crayfish are placed in the larger pond sections and aid in biofiltration. This helps with water quality management, lowering water treatment costs, and also lowering the incidences of disease. In Pond Raceway is a third experimental system that intensifies catfish production in raceways. Large paddle wheels and airlift pumps circulate water continuously through the raceways. Just as with the split pond, several species of fish in the open pond serve as a biofiltration area to clean the water. This system has several advantages. Lowers the feed cost per fish, reduces labor costs during production and at harvest, lowers pond treatment costs, and reduces diseases. Regardless of which approach is taken, the development of sustainable systems for aquaculture must include considerations for the use of renewable resources, effects on soil, water, and air, worker safety as well as the safety and quality of the food itself. And these approaches for aquaculture food production must be profitable for the producer and appealing to consumers in the marketplace. So how do we get there? The Aquaculture Division at Kentucky State University has hit upon a novel way to address some of these issues through a cooperative venture with the local Frankfurt Wastewater Treatment Plant. Yes, you know it as the sewer plant. Wastewater treatment plants are an integral part of any urban community in the United States. With improved methods for processing wastewater, many municipalities are building newer, larger facilities and demolishing the old ones. Some of these idle tanks and ponds could be easily and economically adapted for fish culture. These available resources are often located near the new facilities, providing opportunities for sustainable aquaculture practices. Do I sense a bit of skepticism? Let's take a closer look at how all this works. 
Digester and clarifier tanks and sedimentation ponds that clean up our wastewater are potential fish culture units. Often these units are equipped with water and electric supply lines for air diffusers and surface aeration. Speaking of sustainable aquaculture, now this is where it gets interesting. Live zooplankton, called daphnia, can sometimes be found in active clarifier tanks, especially in areas of the country where the water has high alkalinity and hardness. Sorry, got a little technical there. Daphnia are a great food source for young fish for their first 40 days, or what's called the phase one stage. Daphnia can't survive in water containing toxic materials such as lead and pesticides. So high densities of Daphnia in wastewater indicate good water quality. This might seem like good news to the plant operators, but Daphnia are no friend to the guys here at the water treatment plant. Millions of these Daphnia, sometimes called water fleas, can come together in masses and disrupt the system as it tries to clean the water. This can result in discharge permit violations for the plant. So you can imagine the welcome that Dr. Mims and his KSU staff and students received when they said, we'll be happy to remove the Daphnia from your clarifier tanks and sediment ponds. And of course, after the Daphnia were removed with nets, they became the primary item on the paddlefish fry buffet, which is served daily. This unusual Kentucky State University two-year research project is monitoring fish growth and survival as well as water quality in tanks with static and flow-through processed wastewater. Uh, today we're down here at the Frankfurt Sewer Plant. We're going to sample fish that have been grown in our study now for the last two months. The fish have been fed daily and we're going to see how much they've gained weight over the last two weeks. 19.68. A critical part of the study is the biomonitoring of the fish, that is the tracking of chemical substances in the fish that are grown at the wastewater facility. Researchers look for any contaminants, a safeguard to maximize public protection. Making the biology work is not enough. There must be an investigation of the economic viability of an agribusiness based upon these technologies. Would you like to see a paddlefish? Love to, absolutely. You can see it's a large fish, and of course, what it gets its name from is this large paddle. Now, is this a predator? No, good question. It does have a large mouth, but this mouth is used to filter zooplankton. Why did you pick the paddlefish for this research project? It's found in 26 states around the Mississippi River Basin. As much as 10 pounds of black eggs can be harvested from a single adult female, not to mention its firm white boneless meat. The paddlefish, because of its meat and caviar, is generating excitement and could revitalize a declining commercial industry. I love this stuff. Let's examine how KSU conducted its research. We have eight research tanks. These tanks are eight foot in diameter, six feet deep. They hold about 1,500 gallons of water. The first part of May, we stocked them with paddlefish fry. Paddlefish fry were fed Daphnia. Daphnia are also known as water fleas. These water fleas are slow moving plankton and are easy prey for young paddlefish. After 40 days, the first phase of the study is terminated. The fish then at phase one stage average seven grams or six inches. Okay, let's review. We are seeing sustainable aquaculture in action. Mother Nature creates Daphnia, which, rather than disrupting the water treatment plant, becomes food for the paddlefish fry. And the fish are grown in tanks that have been given a second life after having been shut down by the plant boards. Very impressive. So where do we go from here? 40-day-old paddlefish were sampled to test for organochlorine, heavy metals, and other types of contaminants. After that, then the fish were restocked and the second part of the study was started. We fed the paddlefish a commercial floating diet of 38% protein with 7% fat. Water quality was monitored to maintain optimal conditions for the paddlefish, and the fish were sampled twice monthly to adjust feed portions. After 120 days, the fish were harvested and growth and survival were measured. 
and the fish were sampled for contaminant analyses. EPA National Pollution Discharge Elimination System requires testing of wastewater effluent from facilities before it's discharged into the environment. All right, let's deal with the yuck factor. Public perception of processed wastewater often centers on the belief that the water is contaminated with heavy metals, toxic elements, and other things that make it not suitable for reuse. Psychologically, it is easier for the public to accept the use of lake or river water, which can be higher in contaminants than processed wastewater effluent. In this study, fish sampled after 30 days and 120 days were biomonitored to satisfy potential consumers. The public must have confidence that the food they are consuming is in no way harmful to their health. Results from this study did confirm our hypothesis. Paddlefish did grow better in the flow-through system, weighing about 200 grams or 35 percent larger than those fish that were raised in the static system. We found that the survival rate of 98 percent in the flow-through system was slightly better than in the static system. And the water quality was also better in the flow-through system with reduced levels of ammonia and nitrite. However, we found the fish in the flow-through system did accumulate more heavy metals and pesticides, although these levels were well within the safe limits for human consumption. Though the results show sound potential for aquaculture, such technology must show positive economic viability in order for farmers to adopt it. In 2005, I began working with Dr. Steve Mims to develop a more effective paddlefish hatchery technique. Based on our success at the Frankfurt Wastewater Treatment Plant, I decided to expand production to the nearby Winchester facility where tanks and ponds were scheduled for demolition. Now, instead of being demolished, these facilities can be used for sustainable aquaculture production at a commercial level, for job creation, and for educational opportunities. If aquaculture in this country is to compete in a global market, it must incorporate sustainable practices. As you have seen, reuse technology can provide opportunities to grow healthy fish, and you've seen examples of sustainability. But with the population increasing and wild fish diminishing, we must continue to search for better sustainable means of producing seafood. For more information, go to the KSU Aquaculture website, www.ksuaquaculture.org, or give us a call at 502-597-8110.